Hey, I'm Shannon Rogers. Welcome to the Renaissance Woodworker Shop Update. Today I want to talk a little bit about fixing mistakes and specifically how hand tools, even more specifically, the humble chisel can be the most effective tool at fixing stupid mistakes. First, just a little bit of business. Next Thursday, that's February 1st, I've got another live broadcast, Renaissance Woodworker Live at 6 p.m. on Thursday, February 1st. And I'm gonna do what I'm calling joinery roulette. I've done this a couple times with my apprentices at the Hand Tool School, where we basically just pick a joint and I cut it and we talk about that joint. So uh, I encourage you on, uh, if you're watching this on the YouTube page in the comments below, or if you're watching this on my website in the comments below that, Throw out your vote for uh, the jo the joint du jour. Certainly, you can play, you know, stump me and try to come up with something crazy. But you know, I don't know whether this is necessarily about picking really obscure joints, but more about joints that you might actually use in one of your projects. And let's certainly watch me cut it, watch how I cut it by hand, but then also discuss different ways it can be cut, different ways to troubleshoot if you're having trouble with the joint. So. While I'm more than happy to pull out some crazy Japanese joint from one of my Japanese joinery books, uh, I think it might be more beneficial as an instruction to focus on joints that you may actually use. And maybe you may actually use one of those joints, and if that's the case, <laughs> more power to you. So anyway, I'm working on um, this little cabinet, and um, I mentioned my apprentices earlier. I'm doing um, an apprentice uh, tutorial specifically on making shiplap cabinet backs, and I needed to quickly knock together a cabinet in which to put a back on, and I was rushing and stupidly forgot to size the top and the bottom pieces. So this cabinet, has rabbits on the back. And these rabbits allow the shiplap to sit in here and fit flush with the back of the cabinet. Well, the problem is I didn't cut the top and bottom to length. So now instead of having this through rabbit that the shiplap can sit in and then also nail to the top and bottom pieces, I've ended up with a stopped rabbit, which is not going to work. Not only uh, does it mean that I have to specifically size the shiplap parts to fit in there, but there's no place to actually nail them to the case other than right here on the edge. And that's not going to work for shiplap back. So if you look on the other side, I've already fixed this error and you can see that this uh, face has been lowered down to match that of the rabbits. So the problem I'm faced with is how to reduce the width of the piece when it's already attached into the cabinet. Now, this is just done with dados and nails, but honestly, I used wrought nails on this. And if you've ever tried to take apart uh, a wrought nail joint, forget about it. I worry that I'll end up snapping and breaking this and it's just not worth the effort of trying to do that and then nail it back together later. So I've got to remove a bit of stock that's encapsulated within two side walls. Can't just come at it with a plane because I can't plane away the two sides. Now this is a slightly um, longer case here. It's about 20 inches long. So I've got a little bit of room to play with that will allow me to use a combination of a saw, a block plane, and a chisel to remove all this material, get it perfectly flat and perfectly square as if I dimensioned it before I was an idiot and nailed the case together. So I take my gauge and I just drop it on the side and drop the beam down so that it hits the bottom of that rabbit. And that perfectly sets it so that I can now run it along here on both sides and create a line that I know I need to work to. And pine, it just does not want to show up. So I'm going to darken in with pencil first. So now I want to position my case and I'll lock it in place with a hold fast. And I'm going to come in with a saw, and I'm going to saw down to my lines, making sure that I hit it on both faces, and make a series of saw cuts all the way along the edge. What I'm doing is breaking up the waste here. I'm going to have to chop across the grain, and I don't want to run the risk of the grain running out and blowing out large chunks. So these little stop cuts, technically they're called Morton cuts, interrupt that grain and prevent major blowout, but it also makes it a lot easier to chop out the wood. Now you can put, you know, a whole bunch of these. The more Morton cuts you put in, the easier the chopping will be. But you have to balance that. I don't want to be making, you know, 50 cuts on this board for the sake of speeding things up 
and I'm really dealing in soft pine here that really is not hard to chop at all. It's also a nice straight grain, so pretty predictable how it's going to want to split away on me. If nothing else, look at this as a great opportunity for some sawing practice here, both in starting your cut, following through. These cuts don't have to be square at all, but you do want to touch the line on both faces because not only does it make it easier to chop out the stock, it serves as my depth stop. As long as that kerf is visible, I'm chopping away, I know that I've still got to remove material. And look, just for fun, I've included a knot here just to make things really difficult. And like I said earlier, the more Morton cut you put in, the easier it will be to chop away. So I'm going to put quite a few right around this knot. I'm actually going to try to saw right through the knot. Yeah, you can see that knot just broke right out of there. So it's good that I broke it up with the saw rather than relying on the chisel. Now I want to stand the case up and secure it in place again with a hold fast. I'm going to grab a one inch chisel. Again, the narrower the chisel, the easier it's going to be to drive it through here, but relatively soft straight grain pine and uh, just based upon the spacing of my Morton cuts, a one inch chisel kind of fits nicely between them all. Now I don't want to just go right to my line. I do want to test and see how the wood's going to split away. There's every chance that as I split down, it may dive back and move past my line on the other side. At the same time though, I put a very deep knife line in here. So if the wood does dive back, it's going to want to hinge at that knife line where I've already severed the fibers. I'm just going to go about halfway and sure enough this wood is angling back a little bit so I can tell I'm staying away from my line but if I'd gone right to my baseline here I would have probably gone past my line on the opposite face. And you can see just how easy this wants to split away with these Morton cuts. Except for that right there. It's being difficult. There we go. Look how easy that popped away around the knot because I put all those extra Morton cuts in. Now I'm going to come back and move a little bit closer to my line, but I'm just going to use hand pressure now. And I actually like to kind of pivot into the cut and it will start to split along the fibers. I'm actually working, kind of fooling it into working with the grain here instead of just trying to work straight across, muscling my way across. The grain that is. And this actually gets me really close. I'm going to go straight across the grain and just work right down to the bench top here. And you actually can do the same thing going back the other way, pivoting it towards me, working into the opposite corner. Again, work as close to the lines as you feel comfortable. But the more work we do now, the easier the next step is going to be. So now I'm going to grab a wider chisel, specifically one that's actually wider than the board that we're paring down. This way I can skew it 
and I don't run the risk of my corners catching and digging in. A corner can dig in and possibly splinter some things out. So now I'm just using it like a plane, running along the surface. All of these saw curves, these Morton cut curves, are my depth stops. So as long as I can see those curves on the surface, I know that I've got a little bit more wood to remove. And you may find that in certain areas you have to work across the grain. So now what I do is I use my thumb, as I'm pulling my thumb towards me, I can create a very nice slicing cut. And again, it's just a matter of fooling the wood that you're working with the grain rather than against it or across it. Because I've got a longer run here, you can find that coming in with a block plane can be very effective because I've got enough space to actually work. So before I get too ahead of myself with that chisel, I'm just gonna work it down with the block plane. And this is really beneficial for kind of smoothing out all these individual lumps and bumps from each chisel blow. But you'll also find that first you quickly run out of room on the end. I can't get right up to the end. But also the material on the other side here, I can skew it really heavily and kind of work closer to the edge. But no matter what, I can't really get a consistent cut because these parts on the two extents are actually lifting the plane up out of the cut. I'm actually going to switch directions here as the green is changing on me. See right here, I'm already starting to lift out of the cut because of the, the high spots that I can't reach. But I can get right to my line in the center here. And I can use this as a reference surface. I can now lay the chisel against it and begin to slice my way to the bottom of my cut. It turns out that knot is not going to be a problem at all because I'm actually removing almost the entire knot by going back to my lines here. I'm going to change hands and work back into the opposite corner. So I mention ambidexterity a lot on my videos, and this is yet another reason being able to work the other way, changing hands, is really invaluable here. Okay, I've got just a, a hint of a saw kerf there. Really lighten up my cut and really rely on the reference surface I created back here with the block plane to ride this chisel right into the corner. Got a few little bumps right there. Nice and flat. And again, we're square along the whole length. And perhaps this wasn't the best edge to demo on because there was already a significant amount of forklift damage on the bottom here. So there's some splintering sections, but that's also why I'm making this the bottom of the case. If I flip it around and show the other side, this side matters a little bit more. Granted, it's still the back of the case, but you can see I've got a perfectly smooth, flat surface that's ready to take my shiplap. And now my shiplap boards will drop into place and I no longer have that stop rabbit issue anymore. 
Everything is perfectly level. I've got a good reference surface for the ship upboards to fit against for securing them in place. So I hope you can see just how versatile something as simple as a chisel can be. When we need to get into kind of hard to reach spots, being able to take the tool to the wood and not having restraints like blade capacity or fences or angles or even depth stops can make it really easy to remove this material. At the same time, let's be honest, generally when we've got to get into a hard to reach area, it's because we've screwed something up. We've got to fix something after it's been glued together and assembled. And likewise, say I decided after the fact that I wanted to add a shelf here across the middle. Well, ideally it would be nice if I had remembered that and cut the dados while the two side pieces were, were independent of one another. But being able to take the tool to the wood means I just flip it on its side, knife in a line, saw it out, chop it out, maybe refine it with a router plane, and then I can just slide my shelf right into place, and ta-da, I now have a case with a shelf in the middle. Now, I stress chisel work to my students all the time, is because you're not gonna find a tool that is more flexible, more agile than the chisel. This is essentially has no bounds, no limits, and can reach into the tiniest of corners, which means you can fix all manner of screw-ups. So that's it for me, guys. Don't forget, next Thursday, February 1st, joinery roulette. Let me know what joint you want me to cut, and tune in live at 6 o'clock on February 1st. See you then.